I'm Jamie McCall. I'm from PLB. I'm delighted Rebecca and the HisFest team have invited us again to be involved in this amazing festival and to sponsor this event, Army Girls and the Women That Went to War. Um, PLB is a creative heritage consultancy. Uh, we design and deliver interpretation to engage and enthuse visitors with our shared history. We work with museums, galleries and historic houses and we're currently working at Bamber Castle in Northumberland, Chatsworth House in the Derbyshire Dales and the real star of Bridgerton which is number one Royal Crescent in Bath. We're particularly proud to be uh, able to sponsor this and to introduce our speakers here as we've recently worked with Bletchley Park and we delivered their award-winning immersive experience which was called D-Day Interception Intelligence Invasion in the original Teleprinter Hall, telling the human story of the amazing work that took place there. So I would like to introduce you to our speakers, Dr. Tessa Dunlop, Duncan Barrett, and virtually to Betty Webb MBE. So if I can tell you a little bit about them, Tessa is a historian and a broadcaster who has written three oral history books, the bestseller Bletchley Girls, Sunday Times bestseller, Century Girls, and most recently, to commemorate the 80th anniversary of conscri conscription for women, Army Girls. Along the way, she's become something of a specialist in extreme old age and the Queen, and she's, who is actually younger than all of the women in the Army Girls. Duncan is a writer and an editor, specialising in biography and memoir. He grew up in London and studied English at Jesus, Jesus College in Cambridge. In 2010, he edited the First World War memoirs of the pacifist saboteur Ronald Skirth, published as The Reluctant Tommy. He is co-author of a trio of Sunday Times top 10 bestsellers, The Sugar Girls, which was ranked second in the history bestsellers of 2012, G.I. Brides, which was also a New York Times bestseller in America, <laughs> and The Girls Who Went to War. And last but not least, Betty. So Betty was born on the 13th of May, 1923. She was uh, born in a remote village in Shropshire and her family moved to another remote village near Ludlow in 1926. She was brought up in a household with no car and no telephone and she was homeschooled. But in 1937, she went to Germany on an exchange visit with a German family who were very concerned about the impending Nazi regime. She went on to join the ATS in 1941 and was posted to Bletchley Park, the Government Code and Cipher School, where she signed the Official Secrets Act, which actually meant her parents didn't know where she was or what she was doing. And sadly, they both died before she was at liberty to tell them. Betty still gives talks about Bletchley Park and its, uh, its function and her biography Secret Postings by Charlotte Webb gives her life story in the much more detail and is available from all good bookstores. So now I'll pass you over and uh, we look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> I'm just amazed, Tessa, that you managed to get Zoom working for these things. I, I mean, I've spent the last 10 years interviewing very elderly uh, women, but I've uh, never dared try to do it with technology involved. Can we just... <laughs> You know, a lot of the time when I talk about Bletchley Parker, I sort of say, well, the women, most of them weren't actually really code-breaking. Here we have a genuine 21st century, or 99 next month, code-breaker. How many here have a grandmother or some kind of parent who could begin to do this under pressure? Betty, just tell us. It was taken an hour. And the wonderful thing about you, Betty, is you never give up. How did you suddenly finally appear on the screen? What was the secret? Uh, what do you mean this morning? Yes, this morning. Well, I don't know. It was very frustrating. I think I ought to go back and have some lessons. <laughs> <laughs> can, can I just tell you, as I left the top box, we'd given up. It was 10 minutes, the interview was starting. Rebecca, I mean, who's normally pretty chilled, was sort of a, a, a gauze of perspiration on her forehead. <laughs> And I was thinking, what can we do? Now, the wonderful thing is, Betty, you're a great member of so many different organisations, and the most reliable is the WRAC Association, the Women's... What is it? The Women's Royal Army Corps. Army Association. 
So I ring up Babs, who's 15 minutes away from you, and uh, I think she fought in Northern Ireland, served <coughs> in the Gulf. I'm like, Babs, are you in active service? Yeah. Well, I'm 15 minutes away. She had got in her car, Betty, and was about to hot-foot it to you with her smartphone, and I called her off. We called off the paratrooper, because Betty managed, to, managed it on her own. <laughs> anyway. I would, I would like to add here that Babs was somebody I enlisted into the army in the 1960s. After Betty Stinn in, in the Second World War, you went back into the Territorial Army, didn't you? And you fought yes, for did. equal pay. Tell us a bit about that. <laughs> well, I don't know about the equal pay. I can't remember the figures, but I know I, I wrote a very strong letter to the War Office about the fact that uh, I was doing exactly the same job as my male counterparts, and they were getting more money than I was. <laughs> Boof. I didn't like <laughs> that very much. Anyway, um, uh, Duncan was the inspiration with Sugar Girls. You, I don't know if you can see us. Can you actually see us, Betty? We can see you. Can you see I us? I can see, yes, I can see you, yes. Okay, because we've got this very young, nubile <laughs> writer, right. Duncan. <laughs> Calm down. Well, quite pretty young. <laughs> um, very I good looking, I can say that in my age. <laughs> <laughs> he is a bit of a stunner. Um, so, and he, the reason I ever met Betty was the first book I wrote was Let the Girls, and then she's also in my, my last one. But it was because Duncan wrote such a successful oral history book called Sugar Girls, which is mm -hmm. why we've always had to have this blasted word girls in girls, our books. I know, it's your yeah, fault. Sorry. <laughs> and I didn't even, that book was called Sugar and Spice when I wrote it, but the right. publishers said it had to have the word girls in. Yeah, because we've got yeah. a very progressive history festival here. It's amazing we've been allowed to him. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> And I wonder, Duncan, I, Betty, when I chat to you, and Betty even told me, you know, we talked about the secrets of Bletchley Park, and finally you talked about the difficulties having your periods in the army, didn't you? In my last book, you shared with me the terrible problems you had put on a charge because you had such bad period pains. Do you remember you told me that? Yes, I did, yes, yes. Uh, that, that was a bit of a, a one-off, but it was, uh, uh, it just showed how... Uh, difficult things could be, because the, the uh, um, people outside Bletchley didn't understand um, that um, we couldn't talk about things, and, and it made it extremely difficult. It did, but the reason I was building to it is how Duncan manages, it's quite easy as women, I think, you sort, you know, we sort of chat about all these inner workings, which the army were terrified of. I mean, in all the manuals, this difficulty of putting women in uniform. What are we going to do if they menstruate and lose a day's work? Um, but I wonder how you negotiate that as an interviewer, Duncan, you know, because it's a bit different. Being, I mean, you've been interviewed by a man before, haven't you, Betty? How do oh, you, yes. Yeah. Do you tell them many as many times. things? I'm sorry, could you pose the question again? Well, it wasn't really one. I trailed off because I wanted Duncan to pick do, up on do, it. Do, do, oh, okay. I think Tess is asking whether you find it difficult being interviewed by a man about um, these kind of questions. Um, not really, no. I, I, I would have done years ago, but I think uh, one is a little bit more open these days. Well, Duncan, do you um, find it difficult? Do I find it difficult? Yes. I, I have to say, because we were talking about this in the green room, um, I'm very fortunate that when I do these oral history books, I work with my partner, Nula, uh, and we sort of strategically arrange them. So we, so we have a kind of plan for the interview, what we're going to cover when. And when I know a certain topic is coming up, you know, we've done the wedding and we're getting on to the honeymoon, then I say, oh, I just need to go and make a phone call or I need to use the toilet or something and disappear for 20 minutes and then come back and she's done all of that side of things and uh, <laughs> I can find out when I get home and listen to the tape. Oh, really? That's so, yeah. interesting. It's, it's quite, quite strategic. That yeah. is quite strategic. We're less strategic, aren't we, Betty? <laughs> I, I don't think I quite understand that side of it. <laughs> Sorry. I I it, <laughs> but also, that, that it is, there are the pitfalls of oral history. Mm. Betty's cool as a cucumber because you've written your own book, mm. and she never asks to check what I've written. Because when you... People oh. share things in their sitting room, tell you about their first wedding night or their indiscretions or the time they got put in a charge. And then when they see it written in black and white, it's going to go out into the world. 
they suddenly change their mind and you're sort of a month away from publication. Mm. It's all been typeset and your commercial publisher's losing his cool. And it's a very, it's quite a, it's a, quite a different response. You have to suddenly make alterations. There's a tension, if you like, between the subject you're writing on, the person you're writing on, the human, mm. very most important part of the whole process, and this commercial publisher. I wonder how you manage that bit. It's a bit of a grey area as well, because I think some people sort of assume they have approval over what you write. Some people don't. I don't, I don't, the publishers don't even seem to have an answer to that. I mean, the books I tend to write, if I write substantially about anyone, if I write a couple of pages about someone, I don't worry about it too much. If I'm writing chapters and chapters about them, I would always show it to them, partly because it's useful to... You, you'll find there are misunderstandings that creep in. You've you kind of, uh, you know put two and two together and made five. So they'll pick up on those things. But also because I don't like the idea of people picking up the book and being really unhappy about it. Yeah. But it does then mean that you've got that kind of negotiation to deal with. And it varies. I mean, with the Sugar Girls, for example, uh, one of the women in that, uh, we wrote all about all kinds of elements of her life, sent it to her, she read it, she said, yeah, that's about right, that's fine, that'll do. Another one, we went round and she literally had the manuscript and almost every line had red pen on it and she said right <laughs> you know and we were there for about three hours yeah. going through it negotiating every last detail um i had that you know. betty with ruth Bourne. <laughs> do you know you know ruth Bourne, one of your famous uh, fellow bletchley veterans yes i know ruth yes. a bomb operator yeah she actually fully rewrote two pages of my book wow <laughs> yeah oh, it was to be were fair. They better or worse or <laughs> who knows okay yeah <laughs> But yeah, she, and actually, I couldn't manage. I found it a bit stressful, so I handed her over to my publisher. Because, mm. and I, I think that was that. Right. You know, sometimes a third party can help a bit. Yeah. Yeah, because it's often the the way somebody interprets your life is. I wonder, Betty, you've been in a lot of books. Are there any that you've disagreed with, or have you felt that you haven't enjoyed being represented in them? No, I, I've been very happy and very privileged to have been mentioned in a number of books along the line. And uh, no, I, I don't have any uh, any criticism of what was said, no. I wonder if we may now go from superstar Betty, which is basically what you've become. She was the cover girl, by the way, for National Geographic. Yes, I feel I if was, you could yes. be in the Ukraine working on their computer systems at the moment, you would be, Betty. Ah. Um, and here you are. We're going to come to Bletchley and your journey in a minute. But if we may just go to pre-war... Germany. Oh, that, and that was when I was in Germany, that photograph. Yeah, if you could talk in us through... In 1937. Talk us through what was going on then. Uh, well, in the, 1937, um, there was uh, quite a, a movement towards the uh, Nazi takeover, and the family with whom I was living, uh, very religious people, and they were extremely worried, even as far back as that. And there was a certain amount of uh, food rationing, uh, even in 1937. Um, I was too young to understand fully what was going on, but it was clearly a very worrying time for them. I was always quite interested in that part of Betty's story, where you had this very human relationship, friendship, with a German family. And then once the war starts, especially the way we've subsequently remembered the war, and I'm reminded of this at the moment, with the Ukraine-Russia conflict, you know, one side of the goodies and the other side of the baddies. And of course, in real life, it's never as simple as that. On the ground, actually, those impacted are human beings with, with relationships. You were aware of the tension, weren't you, in their family? Oh, very much so, yes. Particularly as the, uh, the two girls whom you've just seen, they were aged, I think, 11 and 13, something like that. And every Sunday morning, they had to attend um, a gathering which was called Bede and Mädels, Bund Deutsche Mädels. And uh, what went on there, I have no idea, because they never spoke about it when they came home. But I suppose they were be being indoctrinated into the Nazi um, Nazi thoughts. So Hitler Youth, I think, wasn't it? Yeah, Hitler Youth, yes. It's interesting, when I was writing my book about the women's forces, one of the uh, ATS women that I spoke to ended up in Hamburg after the war. So the women would serve, uh, she was an ACAC girl originally, she was serving on the anti-aircraft guns in England, and then uh, 
after D-Day got sort of moved over to the continent and then after the war was over, it was in a stores depot. They didn't need anti-aircraft guns, obviously, anymore because the war was finished. Um, and she had been, she'd volunteered for anti-aircraft duty. She was very patriotic. She was very anti-German. Her husband had been killed during the war. Uh, you know, she just loved the fact that she was involved in shooting these German planes out of the sky. But when she was in this depot, she was working with German civilian women <laughs> Um, and it was a real eye-opener for her, having seen them as this sort of implacable enemy. And she was working with this woman who she noticed um, had a <laughs> wedding ring on her finger, and she ended up asking her, they were talking in sort of broken, a combination of broken English and German, what her story was. And it turned out this woman had also lost her husband in the war, and he'd been a pilot and had been shot down by the anti-aircraft guns over Britain. And so for Jessie, I think it was this real moment of kind of... Uh, it was a sort of epiphany, I suppose, in a way that she and this woman actually had had the same experience, essentially, on the two sides of the war. And these people who she had thought of as this kind of totally monstrous, you know, black and white evil uh, enemy, um, actually here was someone who was kind of in the same situation she was. I wonder, Betty, about your feelings towards Germany during the war. You'd had this very personal relationship, been welcomed by a family, looked after by them, and then suddenly... They're the enemy you're fighting. How did you manage that? Um, I think to an extent I accepted it because I was so um, busy working that um, I didn't really have time to worry about it too much. Unfortunately, um, the, we couldn't continue to communicate um, with, with the family. Um, and sadly... Um, I lost track of them and, and wasn't able to get in touch with them after the war. Oh, that probably doesn't answer the question. Sorry, say again, Tess. No, I don't, but I, there aren't always black and white answers to the questions. You know, and I wonder now at the moment with so much on our television screens with Ukraine and people talking about this old-fashioned form of invasion Russia's doing, to, to what extent it brings back any memories for you, any, any difficulties or, or what your response is really to what's going on at the moment? Emotionally, well, apart, if apart from being absolutely horrified and totally unable to do anything about it, 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 is, it sounds a little bit um, like history repeating itself on a much worse scale. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Only, of course, we can't do what we did then, I suppose, can we? Well, at no, the that's... moment, no. But, Betty, yeah. no. Well, I, there's something about... I don't know, for, for me, I always take great inspiration in that, that uh, and I know that whenever I've spoken to all, all the women I've ever spoken to, there is something hugely comforting about action of any sort on any level. Mm. And I think that's why most, so many of the women that I've spoken to who served in the war, it was about being part of something. It removed that feeling of impotence, which I think so many of us at the moment feel. Mm -hmm. I found myself doing a sort of sponsored marathon. I couldn't then get out of the bed for a week. I thought, well, oh, well, it's because I couldn't join the ATF. <laughs> you know, <laughs> literally, there wasn't some kind of equivalent. I know you felt a bit the same. It's interesting. Well, that was one of your great motivators for signing up, wasn't it? You were at some cookery school and rather bored and thought to heck with this. That's absolutely right. And I mean, the... the, the uh atmosphere at the time was uh, similar, I suppose, to uh, any pre-war thing. Um, and there were quite a lot of us who felt that uh, we ought to be doing something more positive than uh, uh, domestic science, uh, which was perhaps a silly argument, but um, uh, that's how we came to uh, leave the domestic science college and, and, and join up. I joined the AGS, the others were in the WAF and the Wrens and so on. Now let's and, just, uh, if we may, talk about the ATS, because I know Duncan has thoughts on this. Why the ATS? It was seen really as the sort of scaffy service. It was the Cinderella service, wasn't it, Betty? Let's be honest. Well, yes, it was, and because I applied to, get, uh, to join the Wrens, but uh, there weren't any vacancies at the time. It was a question of uh, uh, backing out altogether. Um, or, or joining the ATS. And of course, I, I didn't know at that time uh, anything about the conditions under which we would be trained, which were pretty awful, really. Um, very rough uh, physical conditions and uh, rather a, a rough crowd, if I may say so. But they did a good job. So, you know, why worry about that? The I Wrens was... The, uh, uh, sorry. 
Sorry, Betty. Uh, I, I found, uh, having had a very uh, sheltered life, I found uh, her, for instance, uh, um, table manners, some of them, just horrified me. <laughs> 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 and I told them so. <laughs> which, uh, and which remark, I think, earned me a stripe. <laughs> and having got a stripe, I had to help the officers looking look for nits and I'd never heard of nits. Yeah. It was something totally new to me. And it was not a very pleasant experience, I can tell you. <laughs> I think for a lot of people though, there was a real uh, in the forces, particularly in the ATS, I guess, because as you say it was the kind of broadest probably. I mean the Ren the Rens was the well, senior to, service. The Rens was the the kind of uh, generally where the poshest girls went. I mean, not exclusively, but that was typically, they had the um, designer uniforms, which everyone wanted, these kind of streamlined uniforms yes. that were much sleeker. But um, in the ATS, there was probably more of a mixture. But a lot of people I spoke to said that it was a real revelation for them. One woman said, uh, she said, gosh, this is like a revolution. You know, I, I'm uh, sleeping, you know, in the same room as, as a parlor maid and I'm, you know, practically an aristocrat you know it's that kind of people got to know people from other walks of life in ways that they wouldn't have done before if i may interject uh, mm. um the bletchley ats uh, there were i think something like 300 if not more but an awful lot of them were um university members who had to mm. uh, postpone postpone their course and they ended up in bletchley yes but we know bletchley which we'll come on to in a minute what was Another sort of form of rarefication, you got very cleverly skimmed off the top, anyone that they thought had special services or uses. Mm. And education, of course, most of your smart set could speak an, a continental language in a way that the cabinet, none of the cabinet at the outbreak of war could speak German, but quite a lot of posh girls who'd gone on a sort of year, a finishing year off to Munich could. So I think your, you weren't quite, yours wasn't quite... Some of the Bletchley girls I spoke to had sort of passed out in front of the Queen and so forth, and they'd gone to Munich and, and sort of grandiose times with aristocrats. Yours was a more humble affair on the Czechoslovakian border, actually, your pen friend that you went to stay with. You weren't quite as top draw as some of them, were you, Betty? It'd be fair to say. Well, no. Um, I don't consider myself top draw at all, but uh, <laughs> it was a mixed, mixed bag, very in interesting. Because I... <clears throat> I spoke German, but not sufficiently technical German to use it at Bletchley. And but, I talk um, in those sort of slightly crude terms, but actually when you broke down a lot of the ways, especially in the early part of war, before they got their testing up and running, before they'd recognised they had to embrace the idea of actually using women, recruiting and then conscripting women, they did use the class system as a form of recruitment. That it, there's no two ways about it. And that's why it was sort of a bit of a closed shop to an extent, the rents. It was also a much smaller service, so they could afford to be pickier. The ATS is very big. It had about 300,000 girls, didn't it, Betty, by the end? Yes, that's right, yes. And so before um, you get to Bletchley Park, you have this uniform. Just talk us through the uniform. Well, it was khaki and uh, um, consisted of a um, battle, battle dress top. A very rough material, very, very uncomfortable in a way. But on the other hand, we, we were issued with everything we needed, and um, including your uh, underwear, including the underwear, which which was quite something else. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I wish I'd kept some now to show you. It was, it, it was very, uh, um, well, it, it was flat. There was no. Uh, <laughs> no pattern to it at all and the um, the shoes of course were very uh, well they were very sensible shoes and, and uh, reasonably comfortable um, the stockings were awful they were very thick and horrible um, never mind uh, it was um, enough to keep us warm and, and comfortable passion and we killers were, they were called yeah uh, yes they were uh, but my mother rather liked them because she, she <laughs> used them after the war uh, when she was working with the animals that we had and they were a khaki silk but they were all one size and you uh, had to either put them up under your armpits or down below your knees but either way they were they were quite amusing <laughs> 
So again, you didn't get, you see in the Wrens, they had black silk stockings. And uh, yes. this was a, a source of controversy because some people felt this was a waste of money, basically, that they were you know, giving them these fancy stockings. And they asked the first sea lord how he could justify it. And his response, which I think was not very helpful in the context of something we might come on to talk on about, which is public perceptions of the women in the services, his response was, well, the Wrens liked the feel of them. And so do my sailors. <laughs> so, you know, kind of gives you an idea of some of the sort of innuendo that surrounded the women's forces. I don't know, Betty, whether you were familiar with any of that kind of, um, you know, jibing, that kind of uh, teasing uh, and sort of prejudices to some level about women in the forces, that there were, there were some certain ideas around that a lot of men seemed to hold. Uh, well, um, I, um, I knew quite a lot of the Wrens. It just so happened that a great friend of mine uh, went into the Wrens and was uh, with uh, all the other Wrens at Woven Abbey. And uh, because I was friendly with uh, one of them, I often went to Woven Abbey with her for weekends and I got to know quite a lot of them. Um, and I, I think because we were all doing the same job uh, in, in different sections of course but doing the same job at Bletchley um, we didn't feel uncomfortable in any way. Mm. There was with the last book I did the army girls book I, I found that we remember things that we generally unless it's deeply traumatic and we've put it somewhere and it's stuck a lot of what we choose to remember and reflect on and relive are the happier more positive experiences and it was only when I read people's letters, women's letters, especially girls writing to their own peers, less so to their parents, although not this occasionally crept into letters back to parents, that there definitely was um, pressure on the girls, an expectation that they would manage the advances of men. And it was something that did preoccupy mm. a lot of the girls, that it was, oh, gosh, he was a nuisance last night. I had to sort of, t you know, because it was this terror of getting pregnant mm. I mean you immediately disbanded there was no form of contraception it was just an absolute no-go area mm. and there was a there was a huge furore in the public as well that the ATS was the wrong sort of girl and there was the Markham inquiry which actually sent you know a parliamentary committee to investigate the services and the way they proved that service girls were the right sort was they did a tally and they said there are fewer illegitimate pregnancies in the services than out of them that was the benchmark mm. which meant it was much easier to be a lesbian because pregnancy <laughs> wasn't possible. Literally, they had much less discipline about lesbian promiscuity than they did. It was just very, very interesting. It was, it was all about actually how the public perceived the services because if mum and dad didn't want you to go into that service, then you wouldn't, you know, it was much harder to recruit the right sort of girl. But Betty, of course, your experience was very different because you weren't serving alongside that many men. You were outnumbering the men at Bletchley Park, weren't Absolutely. you? Absolutely. Oh, yes. It was a totally oh, different yeah. setup. Three to one, I think it was. <laughs> my, uh, my partner, Nula's grandfather, worked at Bletchley Park during the war. He was uh, an Italian translator, and he, um, he loved it. He, <laughs> he said, you, you know, there were all these girls there, all these Wrens and ATS girls and so on. It was, I think, for the men who were working there, it was a bit of a picnic, in a way, in some ways. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there were plenty of those, too. <laughs> Betty, let's just, we've got a picture of you up there now in your uniform. I think that's a bit later on in the war when you've been promoted. But let's just talk about that step from the, your training where you're given a stripe, you're able to discipline your peers, to how you end up with your German in, in Bletchley Park. Well, I didn't use it, actually, because Major Tester, who was a brilliant uh, German linguist, uh, gave me a test and uh, while I could cope with a normal conversation. I couldn't cope with any technical words. So I, I never used my, my German. But um, I eventually, and I don't know what, how or why, but I ended up in the Japanese department uh, where I had to paraphrase um, <coughs> translated and transcripted uh, Japanese messages. And that's what took me to Washington, D.C., uh, to work in the Pentagon, and the uniform you've just seen me in was the. Uh, oh yes, you've got an advantage. You've got an example there. Yeah, this is an example um, of your work, isn't it? Paraphrasing yes. messaging. That's right. Yes. Um, so so it was, uh, you you were basically disguising the communications that were used, yes. so that, that the that, enemy couldn't right. guess you'd broken their messages. 
in the hope that if the Japs did pick up the uh, translated messages, they wouldn't realize that uh, we had, in fact, broken their code. Cool. And I, I wonder, stay for... Go on. I wonder if we can just talk about the way in which we revere Bletchley Park and the way it's become such an important part of our national historic narrative. It's, you know, I know partly that's Hollywood, but it's also bigger than that. It's this idea that we outsmarted the enemy in a clean, clever way. And now I've just been really interested where the intelligence told us, you know, Putin was probably going to invade. And, and then, you know, uh, America and British intelligence said, oh, there's going to be an invasion. And there was Macron still flirting with Putin and everyone I knew in Eastern Europe going, oh, it's American propaganda. It's almost like we don't believe in, inte you know, intelligence hasn't got that. If, well, I suppose what I'm trying to say is that this idea of yesteryear's intelligence seems, seems clean and, and something we trusted and believed in, and, and now it seems like it's called disinformation and it's a much muddier arena. I but wonder. we didn't, I suppose, in the war, no one knew about Bletchley, no. did they? I mean, even, I mean no. when I interviewed people who worked in the forces at Bletchley outstations, you, you know, there was a woman I spoke to and she said, well, there was something called Station X, but mm. we had no idea what it was. We didn't really know what they were doing. Do you know what I mean? The level of secrecy. I mean, Churchill called them the geese that laid the golden egg but never clucked because they were so... Okay. You know, that secrecy was maintained, wasn't it? Um, yeah. Whereas I suppose now you're talking about, like, in the media and in public, we're kind of, you know, we, we can debate all this. It's a very different Dodgy discourse. dossiers and yeah. you know, all this sort of thing, yeah. Uh, Betty, I wonder if you could talk us through the impact of that secrecy and, and the extent to which it, it prevented you from understanding really what you were doing on one level, especially when you first entered the park. Well, yes, I mean, the Official Secrets Act, some of you may have uh, had to read it. It's a very frightening document. And suddenly, bearing in mind I was... Uh, 18 and not very experienced in the ways of the world. <clears throat> I read it and I signed it and I came out of the mansion thinking, well, <clears throat> you have no choice. You just keep everything to yourself as you've been told and that's the end of it. And my parents uh, never knew where I was or what I was doing. And they both died before I had the opportunity to tell them what I'd been doing and it's it was a very very strict discipline and i i understand that um <clears throat> it was very well kept throughout Bletchley. Mm. there was a one instance apparently where some girls were talking out of turn and they disappeared from view we never heard about them again it's interesting because retrospective there was always this fear you know um was it keep mum be more like dad this idea that women were less yes. discreet than men we do i think scientifically speak about four thousand more words a day on average as a gender but um but 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 yet when it came to how the um chiefs are laughing in the background <laughs> have you got a word in duncan i'll shut up in a minute <laughs> but but the um the JIC committee was very worried about these young girls, and yet it was in the 60s and 70s, men desperately wanting to leave their mark for posterity, Churchill included. His right, yeah. memoirs had to be fully edited and he had to be drawn across the coals because he wasn't allowed to let the secret out because of the place we were at in the Cold War. Mm. That actually meant, in the end, in the 70s, you know, that Beth, the likes of Betty could finally speak mm. because it had been breached by... Um, not young girls, who actually most of the young girls went back into the kitchen and were never asked about their war anyway. Mm. You know, there's this sort of wonderful irony, of course. Because, Betty, how many times straight after the war, sort of 45 to 65, were you ever asked about what you did? Um, just occasionally, but um, uh, my answer was always the same, that, um, you know, it was... Um, very boring, not worth talking about, or something to that effect. And <laughs> <laughs> you weren't writing the, your memoir back then. The interesting thing is that, um, you see, we were free to speak after 1975, wasn't it? That's right. Um, and knowing that I was free to speak about what I'd been doing, I, I didn't want to. I'd been bottling, bottling it up for so long. I, I just... Um, I just didn't want to talk about it. It was many years before I uh, was encouraged to give talks about it. 
Well, it's a good thing for people like me and Tessa that uh, people of your generation were persuaded to talk in the end. I know my grandfather would literally never talk about the war at all. And my grandmother, who was in the ATS, I mean, this is an interesting uh, question, I think, with the kind of books that we do. Um, you're reliant on people who want to talk, who want to come, you know, who respond if you put out an ad or however you approach them, who want to talk to you. My grandmother would never have talked to anyone about her time in the ATS. Obviously, she agreed to talk to me, grudgingly, uh, but she hated it. She hated it from day one. She resented it. She was very down on it. And it was a real sort of eye-opener to me when you were talking about reading letters at the time that there is always a danger that you, you know, you're getting a certain slice uh, if you go about your history the way that we do because it's you're getting the people distorting. who want to speak. Yeah. And actually, that is a subsection of the whole, you know. Do you feel that, Betty, that, you know, you, you love remembering now. We've had great fun, haven't we? I think what was really stood out for me the first time I met Betty, and there she was, driving along the road with your foot down on the gas. We'd just come back from one of Betty's lectures. I was in the audience. And I said, was it, was the, this is a picture of you up there, by the way, Betty. You're in America, the Pentagon. Um, you're, you're doing your paraphrasing in this brand new green military giant. This, literally, the perspex has just been taken off the building. Wow. You know, in, in, you're the only female ATS girl, I think, in that giant building. We'll come to those memories in a second. And I say to Betty, this must have been the best time of your life, Betty. I mean, I know it was a war, but can we? She went, oh, no, now is the best time of my life. <laughs> <laughs> There's I've been forgotten. something about that remembering process for you that's been great fun, hasn't there? Oh, yes, absolutely. It's, um, it's amazing how interested people are in, in that, um, that part of the war. Because um, America was very different from Bletchley, um, especially as uh, I was one of 32,000 people in the Pentagon uh, <laughs> and the only member of the ATS, which was, uh, I think, something to write about. <laughs> Uh, but um, and you saw some things there. Eisenhower came roaring in, didn't he? But victorious oh, from yeah, the Western Front. Yes, he came in on the tank. It was the centre uh, area of the Pentagon is enormous, and uh, he was able to come in with his tank and a couple of others and masses of troops and uh, waving to everybody. That was a unique experience, I think. And so too were you there when. Um, the, the time, the end of the uh, war, of course, in the Pacific and, and the dropping of the bombs, that was quite an extraordinary moment, wasn't it, really? A complex oh, it one. Very complex. We, we, uh, we just didn't know about it, and suddenly everything stopped. Um, yes, I'll never forget that day. It was the day that the, uh, uh, we, when we were told about it publicly, the, all the owners of cars in Washington fixed their horns and left them on for about 24 hours. You've never heard such a cacophony in all your life. And of course, on the other side of the, the, the world, there were these appalling bombs going off. It, 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 Betty's story and the humanity with which you tell it, Betty, always reminds me of the complexity, because I think there's a danger of, you know, we've turned the Second World War into almost a bit of a fairy story uh, with, with goodies and baddies. And, and, and I remember you talking about later on discovering about the impact of these nuclear bombs and, and, and it left you feeling quite desperate in a way, didn't it? Oh, it's a terrible thing. I mean, um, okay, we didn't want to be overrun by the, uh, by the Japs, but um, to me, it's a totally inhuman thing altogether. Absolutely awful. Just quickly on, on Betty personally, you, you mentioned it there about the, the sort of selection process and the way oral history has inbuilt distortion. I think there is one danger of people like Betty uh, uh, talking to you, Betty, because I think we imagine that all your generation were like you, but of course you are the most, ex she's, Betty's the most extraordinary outlier. I can't underline this enough. I've spent a lot of time with exceptional women, but there is no one I know of 98 and 11 months who A, can get on Zoom, B, does all their own cleaning, C, puts up me, puts up with me, sleeping on her camp <laughs> bed, bringing, dragging in BBC crews at seven in the morning when she's still in her nighty, and he came in through the back door, didn't he? With, oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, quite, you know, so, so there's this idea, I think, oh, gosh, you know, they really were the great generation. And then I spoke to a gentrologist and he said, no, he said, actually, the reason why you're finding you're always using superlatives and these women seem really extraordinary is because, yes, there's luck built into living for a very long time. 
but also you have to be exceptional. You have to have inbuilt ambition, curiosity, multi-generational friendships, really good discipline. I present to you <laughs> the exception of the rule. <laughs> you. you must have found that, Duncan. It's difficult yeah. not to put in adjectives going amazing, wonderful, oh my God, I love her, brackets, <laughs> BFF. I know what you mean, but I don't know if you find this, Tessa, I mean, not, I interview a lot of people for my books. I think when I did the book about the women's forces, I interviewed about 100 people mm. across the three of them. Um, and you remember the ones, you tend to write more about the ones you get on with. Yeah. There are also some who are, are pretty horrible. Or, <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like, you do have bad experience. You have bad days at work where someone is just like a nightmare. Or they just have, don't remember anything. Or, you know, they didn't do anything very interesting. I don't know. I mean... Maybe I've been less, maybe you've been luckier than I me have in fewer. terms of like. I go in deeper. You go in, right, yeah, yeah. So yeah. I have fewer women and I really, they, yeah, I like. So I have, have this sort of casting process where I whittle them down yeah. to the best ones. And then it's true, they are the exceptional ones, but I'm kind of aware. It was a real revelation to me uh, working on The Sugar Girls, which is the first of these books that I did. I can't remember who it was, an old lady who may not even have ended up being in the book. But I, I suppose I'd sort of thought, you know, I knew my grandparents. I didn't know that many people of that kind of generation. And I sort of expected all these old ladies to be quite sweet and kind somehow. <laughs> and I interviewed this woman and she was just absolutely awful. And there was this, she was telling this story about the woman down the road and how, you know, they were friends, but they obviously hated each other. And <laughs> there was all this kind of one up, all this kind of bitchy stuff going on. And I was like, wow, okay, you know, I sort of assumed you'd grow out of that at some point. But no. not necessarily, you know. So I think... I don't know, I, I'm a bit wary of, uh, yeah, there, there is this idea in America, particularly the greatest generation. Yeah. And I, I, I think certainly that generation lived through more than probably any other generation. Uh, but certainly uh, in the, the West. Certainly, that, yeah, exactly. Um, and a lot of the stuff they lived through brought out the best, sometimes the worst, but often the best in them. You know, a lot of them grew, particularly like women in the forces. One of the things I loved about that book is just seeing the transformation in terms of, you know, there was one woman that I interviewed who started off as this really mousy, uh, anxious girl. You know, no one expected anything of her. She ended up in the desert in Egypt, uh, you know, in charge of a whole group of women in the WAF. Um, she was the one they'd come to if they needed a scorpion squashing or they needed directions to Cairo. You know, she came back from the war completely transformed. So for her, she was made exceptional by that experience. And it, but... was, a, it was an exceptional experience for women, wasn't it, Betty? Mm. Because it was pretty dull, pre, predestined, relatively domestic life that most girls were, were, were going to be living and suddenly along comes a war. You know, it was a, a huge transformation for most of you, wasn't it? Oh, absolutely, yes. Um, of course, it depended very much on uh, what you were doing, um, whether you were a, a cook, an orderly, a driver, uh, or on a gun site. Um, all these trades... Uh, very very different but just and, even uh, just being out away from home you know living with other girls people well, your own that's age. Right. yes well of course for, for me it was wonderful because i'd been as, as you all know i was brought up in the country miles away from anything and anybody and the, the very fact of being with a crowd of, of girls and uh, listening to their side of the stories was um, an education in itself for me. And I dare say others felt the same. And also there was that great time when we were all pulling against a common enemy, pointing in the same direction in a way that a yes. lot of Europe that had been occupied and had a much more complex, ambiguous response to the war. I think we see it again with Ukraine now. If Ukraine wasn't a country eight weeks ago, it damn well is now. You know, they're all like, you know, this is what... You, and Britain very much had that. It was, a, it was a kind of high point, the high noon of Britain's identity. And you very much lived that, Betty. It's much more complicated being British now, I suppose, is what I'm trying to say, than it was... 80 years ago? Yes, a very, very different scene altogether. Mm. We won't pursue that. By the way, <laughs> Betty has an no. MBE. Are we allowed to name drop your famous political friend who lives next door to you? Go on, name drop him. <laughs> uh, sorry, name drop about what? You know, the health minister. He's your best. Oh, uh, Sarge. Yes, yeah, my Sarge. friend Sarge, yes, yes. <laughs> 
basically, they're really good chums. And whenever anyone, one of my sort of trendy friends goes, oh, that oh, dreadful man, you know, whatever he's doing next. And I say, well, he's awfully kind to my Betty. <laughs> <laughs> I have to just caveat that with he does have a heart. <laughs> Well, I'm very, we're very fortunate to have him as our local MP. There you go. You see, there's a picture on the wall and everything, I'm telling you. Um, and so we're going to go on to now a bit about, quickly about, and I wonder, Doug, if you can add to this, this idea of the way we remember the war and how important it's become to our national identity, I think partly because it was that high noon experience. Mm. And Betty, for you, it's been life transforming. I don't know if you recognise this picture, do you? Do you remember when that was taken? Yes, where is it? I can't see it at the moment. Oh, you can't it's see it? I don't know what you oh, can that, see. That was one. I was, I'm sitting opposite the Duchess of Cambridge. Indeed. Yes. Uh, there she is. She's uh, got her she listening is. face on. Yes. <laughs> she could be an oral historian. She could yeah. be. <laughs> I think her aunt or something was at Bletchley, wasn't she? No, it's her grandmother and her oh, grandmother's sister. Yeah. Don't worry. No, no, that's all right. I stand corrected. <laughs> but it's been an amazing experience because I think, especially for women, but generally for all people, that agency is removed, people ask less questions, there is a kind of shrinking, if you like, of life, and it's been an extraordinary moment in the sun, hasn't it, this last 10, 15 years? Oh, yes, very much so. Yes. Did you, did you have the picture of me with the Queen? I think that might just be the next picture I've got. <laughs> uh, do, you, do you want to see this? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is that your, the MBE or the Légion d'honneur? Is that the Légion d'honneur? No, the Légion d'honneur. Which um, I think it's for five of us from Bletchley have received. Have you got the MBE there too? Yes, I have the MBE as well. They're a bit too heavy to pin on. The cardigan droops if she sticks them. There you are. There. <laughs> it's very, it's quite competitive because we went on a tour, didn't we, Betty? Do you remember you'd just been given your MBE and we went with oh, three yes. other Betchley girls and none of them could bring themselves to say, well done. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> wow, OK. <laughs> well, it's interesting. I think it is worth bearing in mind because I think sometimes when we think of women in the war, uh, initially, maybe we think of them in those kind of support roles or whatever. But, you know, women were getting medals. There was a woman who got a George Cross for saving a man's, a pilot's life, I think, throwing a body over him when his plane was exploding or something. There was a woman, uh, Constance Babington-Smith, who was the first person to locate the launch sites of the V1, uh, um, the doodlebugs going over, and there were about 2,000 women who were killed during the course of the war. You know, some of them, yes. uh, at the first was on on one of the ACAC sites, literally on her machine, they had this machine called a predictor, which was like this great big box that would calculate, uh, I don't, know, you might, you, I don't know if you're better on the technical side of this yeah, than me, but it, it well, calculates the length of the fuse, and yeah, exactly. Right. And the box is moving around, and she was mortally injured, but stayed on her job on this, on this elaborate box uh, long enough for someone else to take over, and then literally fell down and died at their feet. And the guns never stopped firing. That was something. And they were but all the very irony, powerful. of course, isn't it that women were non-combatants? Absolutely yes. essential. They retained their non-combat status, mm. which meant, of course, they could die for king and country, but they yep. couldn't fire back. So there was, and that really, the, women have only been allowed into every area of the army. In, in um, 2018, I think finally. I mean, I always don't know about you, Betty, but I always think there's something interesting about how we look or gauge women's progress in the military through the extent to which they're allowed to man up right up until 2018. And we don't look at the, the humanising aspect that women in uniform bring to the military services. It's your good friend, our very good friend, actually, Ali Brown, a former Colonel Ali Brown, who said to me, well, when we were on the ground in Kosovo, you know, women and children came to us. You know, actually, there they are. Often it's your peacekeeping mission. You're a huge part of a nation's propaganda when you're on the ground in, in British military uniform, and you need to be approachable. And female soldiers are more approachable. Mm. Yeah. Betty's silent. That's. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, I'm, just so, quickly I'm on sorry. The the, uh, I'm sorry. The sound has gone a bit. I didn't catch well, all we're you. We're very said. near the end. I'm just going to put up a little picture of the Queen, who looks very like Prince William. There, doesn't it? What? <laughs> yes, the jeans. Um, but it was very interesting to finding out more about the Queen's service because um, she was really just 
popped in at the end there as a sort of morale booster. But she's been a great way, as you have been, of sort of remembering the war, tying us back to that nostalgic period in the Blitz, hasn't she, in a way, Betty? And it was in that context yes. that you two met. I think she was rather in awe of you, wasn't she? She wrote you a letter. Well, no, she didn't. Her, her um, um, oh, what do you call it? Uh, her equerry. Her equerry did. Yes, that's his letter, not hers. Mm. But still, I think she was mo clearly moved by the experience. I think she was. She was very kind. She spent a lot of time with me. Whenever I was... hear something about the Queen's health, I just ring up Betty and check she's OK. And I think, well, that, that's fine, because a... you're two years older, three years older than the Queen. Yes. And also wears those perilous court shoes. I'm like, what about a pair of my soft sandals? You don't have any soft sandals, do you? <laughs> I do, actually, now. <laughs> do you? <laughs> Well, sh should we open it up to questions? Is, would this be a good time to... Uh, I think we've got questions in the room, and then this... If this iPad doesn't die before we get to them, um, we might have some questions. I gave Duncan well. the onerous task of Well, here the we iPad. go. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with a question on the, on the iPad, uh, since it's only got 10% battery. It says, Hi, Betty. Sorry to sound like a local news journalist, and I just want to know what your, tops for a, your top tips for a long life are, and most importantly, your advice for living well and happily. Did you hear that, Betty? Oh, my yeah. goodness. I, I don't know whether um, I have any recipe for that, except that I come from a, a family of long livers. <clears throat> One of them had his 102nd birthday this last week. And there are... <laughs> but apart from that, I suppose... Um, eating sensibly and exercising sensibly, um, but a lot of it is the luck of the draw. It's also, um, you um, have an extraordinary optimism, Betty, and you're very good at maintaining relationships. I think that there is something key in that. Yes, I, I agree with you. I think one <clears throat> needs to uh, find friends, make them and keep them. Yeah, that's why I'm here today, stalking <laughs> Rebecca. <laughs> yeah. um, and, Oh, sorry, I was just saying, are there any questions here in the room as well? Anything anyone would like to ask, either Betty or either of us? Yeah? Um, is there a mic? Yeah. Now I have the fear and the sweaty hands of the whole thing. <laughs> um, first of all, Betty, thank you so much. This is the first Zoom call in two years where I haven't felt like wandering off and just, you know, folding washing or something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much for getting on to Zoom today. Um, so because you've been mentioning Ukraine a lot, it's, mm -hmm. I'm a humanitarian advisor working on Ukraine at the moment, and I come to conflict and war from a very different perspective. And I don't know if you know, but actually the, uh, in the east of Ukraine, it's the, globally it's the oldest uh, caseload of uh, humanitarian needs in the world, especially mm -hmm. elderly women as well. And one thing that we're terrible at is being able to understand and transmit not just the needs of people who are elderly but also the capacities and strengths and i'd really be interested in your advice from the kind of the sensibility of oral historians and social historians on how we can do a better job of telling that story in real time obviously without kind of getting into an oxymoron of real-time history but you know it's really we don't want to tell this story 10 years down the line we want to be able to transmit this now thank you do you mean as in like how do we get the stories out of Ukraine uh, of the elderly people now? Yeah. I feel like that's I don't know about you. I mean you <laughs> you're more of a journalist than I am, but like I I, I guess I, I mean there are safety issues presumably. I mean obviously the journalists who go in I I've no idea. I mean obviously if people can zoom or can speak on the phone or whatever then that is great. I mean I, Go I'm in there. Very I, I can probably help you with the with a con with a co contact in East Ukraine on that because I'm going into Moldova next month for the end of the Transnistrian conflict, and actually one of the places I'm interviewing is an old folks' home, because the the perspective they have on this. But I think it's absolutely vital, and it was again in the pandemic where we, 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 I thought a lot of the very old generation who were most impacted were without a voice. Mm. You're so right, and actually those least able to move away from harm are old people. Uh, funnily enough, we've just been working in the north Romanian border with a woman who'd 
was visiting her family, 86, contracted coronavirus, ended up in North Romania with coronavirus in a hospital, then had to get back to her home in Georgia via Turkey. The whole thing was a sort of, and it was a hugely expensive as well, and she had no money. It's, it's absolutely horrific, but we don't hear that story. We see the, it's, it's, it's almost like we've, in many ways, the optics are quite, seem quite regressive. It's a very male war for understandable reasons. The women and children are very female, and they're the ones leaving. And there's a total absence of old people. We're simply not seeing them. They, can't, they don't feel able to leave. They don't want to leave. They, uh, they have um, a less knowledge, actually, of a lot of what's going on in the war because they don't have access to social media. But I would try and access some... Of, I'll see if I can help you access some of those... The, the care homes where they are. And of course, elderly people in Ukraine aren't generally as old as Betty. You know, the life expectancy, I think it's about 10, 15 years younger in Ukraine. I don't know, there won't be very many 99 year olds, I don't think, alive in East Ukraine, Betty. But do you oh, feel, I, I mean, you're exceptional in the voice that you have for your age. Would you agree with that? Uh, well, yes, I, I think so. Although, um, I mean, obviously, I'm not. Um, as sprightly as I used to be, but I, I think the, the thing is to do as much as you can for yourself. That, that uh, to me, is um, partly the recipe. And it's also life-saving, though. You told me in lockdown that you, and you did 15 newspaper interviews, and it kind of saved oh, you yes, in many well, ways. One day, yes, yes. Wow. <laughs> yes, I had, had more to do during lockdown than I, I did in other years. <laughs> But, and so that goes to show the impact, you know, just giving them a voice, accessing them, asking them. I, it makes the impotence we all feel, it's sort of a hundredfold, I would imagine, for them. Yeah, ghastly. It's, it's interesting, though. I mean, you were saying the, the f sort of face of the war in Ukraine is very male. I mean, I suppose that's true, but I was very struck by these images of, you know, female MPs uh, yes, getting hold of guns and being like, you know, we're going to defend our country. Yeah. I mean, I think there is that sense, that's one of the things that's quite shocking about some of those images, is that idea of, you know, people from all walks of life uh, getting involved, just as they did with, with the women's isn't? forces. Yeah. Exactly. It, I mean, it reminded me of that, the idea, and obviously, yeah. the women, you're right, the women's forces in the Second World War, yeah, they had, they, in order to deal with this kind of public uh, issue with the idea of, of women serving, they had to have this royal proclamation that said that women were not allowed to use deadly weapons, um, which meant, for example, on the ACAC sites, they had to have men as well. So the women did all the calculations and used all the complex machinery to make sure uh, that the shells hit the planes, which they very rarely did, to be honest. But, you know, in, in theory, they hit the planes. But a man had to pull the trigger. That was the rule. You know, a woman was not allowed to touch that because then she would be killing someone, potentially. But, but even so, it does, it does strike me there is something unusual about that idea, I suppose, of civilians being militarised, and particularly female civilians being militarised in that way. Any other questions? Uh, right, let me... How's your do, let's, do what, let's do one in here while I, it keeps logging itself out. Any more questions in the room while I try and find out what the next one on here is? Yeah? Sorry. <laughs> is that our sponsor with a question? We better get the answer right, Duncan. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is for Betty. Um, there was clearly lots going on at Bletchley Park and at the Pentagon. You're an incredibly intelligent woman, I know. How much did you work out of what was happening elsewhere at those sites? Or did you just focus on the bit that you were working on? Yes, yeah, so this was the thing, you see. We were not allowed to talk about anything outside our own office. Um, either talk about anything we saw, read or heard. Uh, unless you were very senior, and I wasn't. Um, and we certainly were not allowed to uh, communicate outside our own particular office. That was one of the great ways they held the secret, wasn't it? That even if you got strung yes. up by your ears, you wouldn't have had much to tell them anyway. It's sort of concentric circles of knowledge and very few people were sort of in wise at, at the top level. And I think that's practice anyway in the military, but particularly in intelligence. Just gonna take you on my journey with Betty. That's Betty's book, which she wrote, which is how I found out about her. And then I banged her in this book. This is at the National Army Museum. You do installations there, don't you? Um, do you remember that, Betty? That was before yes, lockdown. I do. Yeah, look yeah. at me getting my book in and not hers. <laughs> then she has a cameo with her periods. 
in Army Girls. <laughs> and then in, in, we've got to let Duncan in there somewhere. Um, and uh, it's been absolutely brilliant coming here today. Thank you, Rebecca. Rebecca doesn't often talk about the World War II. I think it's a bit contaminated sometimes. But I think sometimes the telling of World War II has been unhelpful in some respects for our contemporary British political story. So it's very, I'm very appreciative for HistFest hosting us. It was Duncan's idea. It was and yes, because I know Rebecca had said uh, we don't do we don't yeah. do World War Two. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Not doing World War Two stories, but I th but you see I think I mean it's interesting. So we both so I've written a lot about women in the war. You've obviously written a lot about women in the war. I don't do like military history I don't you know like I, I can barely understand what this machine is that helps them see the planes I'm not into any of that at all I'm much more interested in civilian experiences of war in kind of those you know sort of ordinary in quote marks people's experiences of war whatever they are um, and I do think someone said to me a few years ago they said you know what's wrong with you why are you so obsessed with war you've written about the first world war you've written about the second world war you know why do you write about something else my feeling is it's just that it's uh, particularly the Second World War is a period where so many people are put in situations that would never, they would never have been put in before. And it's fascinating if you're interested in ordinary people's experiences of history, how that changes them, what, you know, what they go through, what those kind of personal stories are. And it's obviously, about belonging. it's about, yeah, and it's about finding, mm -hmm. you know, being able to talk to people like Betty and get it from the horse's mouth. I mean, when I've written about the First World War, you can't do that. You only get the letters and so on. But being able to speak to people and find out what it was like, I think is, you know, a great privilege. And it's really. also about the relationships. I, in May, in case you haven't guessed, I really love Betty, and I love you for persevering with Zoom this morning. <laughs> I was almost in tears on the stairs, and I think, I think Betty sounds quite stressed, but no, up you pop, cool as a cucumber. I love you, Betty. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much. <laughs>